Hi everyone, welcome. We'll just give it a, a moment and let everybody get into the webinar. Welcome everyone. We're we're just giving it a moment. We'll let everyone get in. Okay, great. Let's get started. Thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Shannon Gannam, and I'm the Global Education Director at Magnum Photos. And with my colleague, uh, Pauline Vermeer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New York, we are your hosts for the Beyond Magnum series. Beyond Magnum is an in-depth talks program created to explore some of the challenges facing our agency and our industry today. Through this series of free talks in chapters addressing archives, representation, and the future of photography, speakers will share thoughts and engage in debate across a range of issues. Each section will be led by respected figures from the world of photography, and speakers will range from practitioners to academics to subjects of photographs. Uh, recordings from chapter one and chapter two can be found on the Beyond Magnum page and on the Magnum Photos YouTube channel. And you can hear more from our president, Olivia Arthur, about the aims of the program in the first session. So a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off uh, session two of chapter three. Uh, today's event is being hosted via Zoom webinar. Please put any questions you have um in the q a box and we'll try and answer as many as possible and also you have the chat function which you can utilize as well and we recognize that this series of events will likely raise more questions and answer them and that it is the beginning of a conversation so thank you for your contributions to that dialogue uh, you'll be seeing more from us following this program about how we will take that dialogue forward for us as an agency and as part of a wider industry and with that, I will hand over to Pauline to introduce uh, our co-chairs, Fred Richen and Zara Rasul for this session. Hi, Pauline. Hello, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Zara Rasul, who is going to be um, telling us about her practice and her years and uh, of practice and projects in this um, talk. Uh, Fred Richin, who spoke this morning, uh, brilliantly will be in conversation with Zara as she presents her projects. And so I'd like to present Zara Rasul to you for those who have missed the uh, introduction this morning. Zara Rasul is an Emmy nominated producer, writer and media entrepreneur whose journalism, storytelling and innovation centers marginalized communities and people of color. Still here, her more recent work about incarceration and gentrification in Harlem premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. Zara's past experiences bear testament to her commitment to innovation and community-centered storytelling. In 2015, she founded G-Story, an interactive map and social platform to deliver news summaries, um, summaries to millennials globally. In 2016, she joined Riot as managing editor and later the Huffington Post to build on of the first um, companies to use emerging technologies for editorial storytelling. She was recognized as a global media game changer at the International Broadcasting Convention in 2018, nominated for the Robert um, Magruder Award for Diversity Leadership in 2019, and the American Express Next Gen Leadership Award in 2020. In May 2017, Zara created and launched AJ Contrast, part of Al Jazeera Media Network, one of the largest, most diverse global operations broadcasting news to over 400 million households in more than 150 countries. Since 2017, Zara and her team has been have been nominated for 31 media and film awards and have won 15, including an NABJ award, an RTDNA award, two online journalism awards, OJA, two webbies and one shorty among others. Her documentaries have been screened at over 40 international film festivals, including at Sundance, Sheffield Dogfest, and Berlinale. 
Outside of her homes in New York and Mumbai, Zara li has lived in Doha, London, and Chonam in South Korea. Zara, we look forward to hearing more about your projects now. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you to Pauline. And I'm going to start by asking Zara one or two questions, then she'll show you some of her work. And we'll go back and forth and take questions from everybody who's here who wants to raise any. Um, Zara, let, let's just get started. You, you're from India, you came to the United States, you studied at the University of Missouri. How did you end up in a kind of a diverse media practice uh, coming from a a very conventional university in the middle of the United States? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Uh, it was not easy at all. I'm gonna, you can talk a little bit about my experiences there. Uh, but, you know, just speaking a little bit about like how I came to Missouri, why I picked the school, why even journalism in the first place. I grew up at a time, I was born in 1990. I grew up when I remember at home with my parents sitting on the couch, we watched the news every single night. That was family practice. And we watched BBC, we watched CNN International. That time we got Al Jazeera, but only for 30 minutes. And the, the news that was mostly being covered was about the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq after that. And, you know, it as, as somebody who was born and raised Muslim and most of my family is Muslim, um, what I was seeing on television felt very, felt like a disconnect from my reality in terms of, you know, the way, the rhetoric, the narrative, the representation of Muslims that I was seeing on, on, the, on the news. And, you know, from, from a really young age, we were having these conversations in my house and, you know, we, I was expressing about like, yeah, but, you know, dad, why, why is it that they are perceived this way? You know, why is it that you know, that's the only only image that's being showed. Or, you know, if you see Muslim women in the news, all you're seeing is Muslim women that are completely veiled or wearing the full hijab. And that's not the only way Muslim women are. And we're definitely not only defined by our dress. And I think, you know, at a young age, my parents instilled in my brother and niece that, well, if you think something's not working, you've got to change it. Because if people are just going to stand on the sidelines and criticize, it's never going to be any different. And so I think, you know, for when, I, when I was pretty young, I, I knew I wanted to be in the media. I knew I wanted to maybe go into journalism. And so when I was looking for universities that taught journalism, Mizzou actually surprisingly is one of the best and the oldest university to teach journalism as a, as a course and a practice um, in the United States. And so, you know, I applied and uh, I moved from Mumbai to Missouri at the age of 18. <laughs> As you can imagine, that definitely wasn't the easiest um, experience. I grew up in a city that's huge, like 15 million, 17 million, depending on whether you count, you know, the, uh, the, the suburbs. And in my head, I grew up watching a lot of Hollywood movies. So I was like, oh, it's going to be cool. Missouri is going to be similar to Mumbai. Uh, not, not knowing, I mean, at that time that what I was getting into was just completely unexpected. And I was studying in a small town called Columbia, which is nestled between St. Louis and Kansas City. And when I mean it's small, like, I did not visit any place that was as small as that growing up, because even when we traveled, we traveled to bigger places. Um, and so, of course, when I went there, I mean, culture shock is, uh, um, I think it's a very generous word. And, uh, and you know, it, it was incredibly difficult, um, even just from a lifestyle perspective, you know, growing up in a big city, bustling, cosmopolitan, lots of people, to then going to the small town where all around you are fields um, but apart from that, I think it was also going to a place that was so white. Uh, I didn't have to confront my identity until I went there. I didn't know what it meant to have the color of my skin and to look the way I looked until I was placed there. Because I realized that I was defined so much by, of course, the 
the racial makeup of this country and how people perceive somebody like me, but also my religion to a great degree, because most Americans, their sort of understanding and their connection to Muslim people and the religion of Islam stemmed so much from how Muslims are represented on screen. And so constantly I get, I kept get, getting asked questions like, were you allowed to come here? Did you have to take special permission? Will you be able to talk up in class? Uh, you know, if I had like a male friend with me, it was really interesting to see how questions get, would be asked to him rather to me directly. And it happened at Walmart and Bank of America when I wanted to start a bank account. And, you know, that was like, that, that was definitely sort of, and a reckoning for me in, in terms of I'm placed here. I have never thought about these questions. Now, very quickly, I have to figure out how to be, how to exist in this space. Um, and then apart from that, I think it was like, you know, Mizzou is, a, is an amazing university for journalism. But when I was interning over the summers, I quickly realized that the school, what we were learning theoretically was at least if not five years behind or 10 years behind what I was experiencing out in the field. Um, you know, I, I definitely struggled to finish my undergrad, not gonna lie. Um, I, I, do, I was, I'm glad I did two degrees. I, I have a double major in international studies, international politics and broadcast journalism. But I remember I started my master's right after finishing undergrad, which was, I did a four years plus or one and a half year master's program. And after my first semester in master's, I was just very disillusioned. And I was like, this is not really benefiting me because I'm not learning things that are actually going to be useful in the field. So I'm just going to go and work. And I started doing a fellowship. And in that, in the process, my professor at, at Mizzou, who I was in touch with, he told me, well, if you don't, if you don't come back and finish your studies, you're never going to get your master's. So I was like, okay, well, I'll come back, but I want to do my own thing as my master's. I want to build my own master's course. And he was like, well, what do you propose? He's like, I'm going to work on my own startup. And he was like, well, nobody's ever done it, but nobody's stopping you from presenting that idea to the Dean of the Journalism College. And I did present to him and, you know, they were really kind and they allowed me to build my own master's program. And part of that, I went back to do my master's and I instead worked on a startup called Gistry. And this was in 2013 when, you know, the media industry was being, dis the journalism industry was being disrupted by social platforms. People didn't know what to do with Facebook, didn't know how to post on Instagram. Should we even be sharing our articles for free on these platforms? And we created the startup, which is, you know, the, the homepage looked like the map of the world and you could sort of zoom in to see where news are happening in different parts of the world. And you can click on sort of the, the tags and it would bring up a summary of a news article. And those summaries of what's happening were, were always written by people that were living in those places. And we had a team of editors that would correct it and verify it for authenticity, for facts and for tone, and then publish it. And then we used, we essentially built, we built it as a social platform also. So everything got posted on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook, and we made videos, and this was really early on. And of course, I built that as a prototype, presented it at a conference, and you know, it got way more attention than I expected. Um, I ended up doing it full time for a few years. So that was sort of, you know, that's kind of how I navigated a, being in a traditional space, mm. kind of trying to disrupt it on my own, which is, is difficult and not always possible. So when you were saying that when you interned and the, the media companies were five or 10 years behind, what, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, I remember in my broadcast classes, we were being taught to use software that we weren't even using to edit videos. Mm -hmm. We were being taught how to use Avid. And, you know, when I was actually working in the newsroom, we had moved past all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also the way we were framing shots, um, sort of like, I remember being trained in broadcast class, how to talk with 
an American accent and I don't have an American accent. And to them, if you're on TV and you're a broadcast journalist, that's the only way you can present the news. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was, I was made to conform a lot in order to be in the broadcast field. But when I was, when, when I was, out, in the, when I was out in the real world, those things were mattering less and less because we were making those changes. It didn't matter if you had an accent, you could present the news with an accent. Mm-hmm. So when you went to Al Jazeera, what was your, you know, with all the stuff you did before that, what was the sum of your vision at that point? What were you trying to do? Uh, how did you express it to the management so you were able to start AJ Contrast? I know you hired uh, your staff. It's all women from, you know, different countries and so on. What, what was your vision, your, your sense of what you, you were trying to accomplish? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to talk about how I was able to build AJ Contrast. I just want to preface it by saying that, you know, most places that I did want to make a change, especially when they're in big companies, is not easy. Before that, I was in several situations where when I would propose sort of like, you know, we should be using more social media. We should be thinking about how we actually create a content that's native for those platforms and not just like, when you have a 30 minute documentary, let's just cut down two minutes of it and put it on the social platforms. We shouldn't be doing that. I mean, even like now that seems so intuitive and and that feels so commonplace. But at that time, when I was saying those things, there were barely any people who actually heard and supported it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, making those kind of changes seem easy, but I think they sound like it should be easy, but it's not, especially when you're working for big organizations. And that's including Al Jazeera, I'll say that. Um, Well, AJ Contrast came about because Al Jazeera Digital was sort of a new creation within Al Jazeera. They wanted to, they were doing the digital side of the network and they wanted to be in the innovation uh, innovation space because it was a trend. It was a hot thing in 2016, 2017. All news companies had an innovation team. Um, and so they asked me, you know, they'd heard about me and my work and they asked me if I would come on board to create this, this studio. Um, and, and before that, I was working for Ride that got acquired by the Huffington Post. And my experiences weren't positive. Uh, was incredibly challenging. I was frustrated. I was demotivated. Um, and so I was at that point ready to sort of like rethink my career and be like, maybe there's something out there that's not journalism related that I can do when this offer came up. And, um, you know, when I, I think I was like, well, I'm going to put everything on the table and ask, tell them this is all that I want. And if they accept, well, I'll do it. If not, I'm going to look for something else. And I did. I told them, I want to have control. First, I said, I want to have control over my own editorial. Second, I said, I want to bake in a business model into the studio because I know the work that I'll be doing is so niche that if there are budget cuts, the first thing that gets gets slacked or then that, you know, gets dropped is my team and me. So if I am able to figure out a business model where I can bring in money, then I am not at the mercy of the budgets, just at the mercy of the budgets. Uh, I wanted to hire my own team, choose the location of my work, and and there were a couple of other things. And, you know, they did agree to those. And so that's kind of how AG Contrast came about. And and the idea was that at that time, quote unquote, emerging tech, which is not anymore emerging in the US, was something that everybody was trying to figure out how to use it for editorial storytelling. And, and, my, and I had been in this industry for a few years before taking on this job. And I kind of knew what worked and I knew very, but clear, clearly, more clearly, I didn't know what didn't, I knew what didn't work. And so my, my mission became, okay, we're gonna show how we can do journalism and tell these stories more ethically, more authentically, more collaboratively rather than the practice that is standard in the industry. And did you have any models that you worked off of or is this autonomous, just you? Oh, in terms, of, in terms of models, I mean, to me, it was collaboration. That was first and foremost, like what I wanted to bake into the process. But were there any other media companies or institutions or uh, cooperatives or anything that influenced your thinking? Or did you just want to have a fresh start? 
I just, I wanted to have a fresh start. Like I said, you know, I had worked, you know, I, I being at the Huffington Post before that at Riot, which was a startup and then inside Huffington Post, having worked with the New York Times Innovation team, the Guardian team, all of those, I kind of knew what was happening. But I also, I think to me, what helped me create the entire vision for contrast was like, these are all of the things that are not working. Now we're gonna make sure that we, if we're gonna create something new, it has to rectify those issues that we're seeing in the industry. That sort of became the model of what contrast was. The way I understand it also with your collaborators, the people you work with in the field, part of your mission is also to help train people, give them equipment, not just to send people there to take over. Do you wanna talk about that? Absolutely. I think I would say most of the work we do with contrast is on the back end. It's the training and the education. What you see out the, the documentaries and the films and the interactives, that's a smaller percentage of our work. Uh, one of the things that I was noticing working in this space is that because in this emerging tech space, the technology in itself is expensive and requires specific skills to to use and education, a lot of people whose stories were being told were not able to participate in this process of telling stories because they didn't have the education and they didn't have the tools. So um, our mission of contrast became, well, we're going to take that on us and we're going to train them and we're going to give them cameras and we're going to give them manuals and we'll translate it in the languages they need so that they can learn and then we'll work with them once they have the necessary skills and education to produce the piece with them. So by training them, we're also getting something out of it is that we can collaborate on a story with them. Uh, and so every single piece, whether it's a social media, whether it's a documentary, we followed that, we, we followed that model through all of the work we've done. I remember, for example, I think it was in South Sudan, you trained local people in virtual reality, you gave them cameras, I believe you left them with the cameras so that they could continue to work. And I don't know of any other model that does what, what you do in that sense. Yeah, we did, you know, everywhere we went, when we, we went to South Sudan, went to Nigeria, uh, went to Bangladesh, you know, we did with we did an initiative with homeless people in LA, like everywhere. Most recently, we worked with some refugee kids out in California. We've taken equipment or sent equipment, left it there so they can also continue to use it after we've left. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, let's turn to Still Here because I know you're going to show some work from that. Still Here, the kind of backstory is it's, it's formerly incarcerated women of color uh, from Harlem in, in New York. And what happens after they're back in the world, after the incarceration ends? And you worked with a, a community group that, that supports these women. You did oral histories. Do you want to talk about that process? Sure. Yeah, so still here is the story of Jasmine Smith, who returns home after being incarcerated for 15 years. And Jasmine's story is, Jasmine is a composite character, which means is that we've collected the stories of several women who were formerly incarcerated and then created a character based on their experiences, which is which is the character we follow through in our in our film and it's interesting because still here and, and, and i loved what you said in the last in the last talk in the in your morning talk where's what is an image we're grappling with this idea of what constitutes an image and i think like as you know i was thinking about my practice and i think that's a question that i've been sort of trying to navigate or answer through all of my work because we had a very clear idea of what's image and what's video but now I'm using all of these techniques, virtual reality, augmented reality, filters, artificial intelligence. Are those videos, are those images? How do you categorize those things? Um, and, and so, you know, I think to me, images is everything. All of that is, is an image to me. Um, mm -hmm. And then with Still Here, I think the other interesting part of the project is for the first time, I actually worked on a project that in some ways you can say blurred the lines of what's strict journalism because we did all of the oral histories and we, re we reported on the topic extensively and we worked with you and you curated the photo exhibit which is purely journalistic but but the the portion the vr portion and the augmented reality portion they're scripted it's fiction it's 100 percent fiction we worked with a we worked with a screenwriter 
and we worked um, you know, with a feature writer on the VR script and the AR script. So it's not, you know, it's not hundred, it's not journalism in the way that we imagine it. We used, we shot the entire VR piece and like, you know, we had actors and we had a set and all of those, but then we brought in graphics and, you know, we had infographics and in the AR piece also, everything's created, it's fiction, but then we bring in journalistic elements of like real images from the past. We bake in the entire AR piece has photographs through it. Those photographs are real, but the story in itself is fiction. So we've blurred so many lines of what's journalism, what's not, what's fiction, what is not fiction. And I think that entire piece is, you can, it raises so many questions. I don't know if it answers a lot of them, but it makes you think about all of those different aspects. Well, you also, you know, being with you in Sundance when, when it was up, you know, two of the women whose lives were being documented, you came out, uh, you know, to see it. They did the virtual reality. And my sense of it was they found the, the you know, fiction or hybrid fiction, you know, very authentic uh, to the experience, uh, you know, more from a, you know, from a head wearing a headset, uh, being able to move around and see different things and so on and so forth, which I imagine for many people was their first experience of virtual reality. They found it had something very real to it as well. So that the fiction complemented the nonfiction and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to show some of this still here. Yeah, I'm going to show, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you just the video of what the installation looked like at Sundance. Uh, sitting in a prison cell three years ago that I will be at Sunday. <laughs> Brought back any good memories, Brad? <laughs> I remember the snow in Utah now. That's a, <laughs> it comes back. So, what what do you think the impact of that was? You know, people going, the feedback. How did you know what was it like? Was it a validation for the women whose lives were being depicted? You know, when I you know I, I saw a number of people crying as they watched it. People who had siblings who were who'd been locked up. You know, different things like that. Um, what, what's your sense of the you know impact of, of that kind of uh, putting together a number of media you know so that it, it works in multiple dimensions? Sure, yeah, I think you know one of the reasons we decided that the story of incarceration would actually be would work in VR is because you are 
playing with this or you are exploring this idea of freedom. And to me, I really don't think every piece, any, every, every piece work you do should be in VR or should be in AR or for some reason should use some new technology. Some stories are much more effective when they're told through photos and 2D video. But for, for us, when we were thinking about incarceration and this idea of freedom or restriction of freedom, the technology lent itself very easily to exploring that issue because in the headset, this is an interactive piece so you can move around, but the amount you can move is predetermined by us, the developers and the creators of the piece. So we're telling you, you're free to move around this house, but you can't go beyond this point, which is essentially this idea of incarceration. When you're in a prison, you can move around, but you, ha you have limited physical space because you're confined in a space. But even once you leave, your life is restricted, not metaphorically, in, in, in actuality, by the, by the things you can and cannot do, lack of an unemployment, of lack of employment, lack of housing, inability to, to reunite with your family, those are all real things that restrict movement and your ability to actually be fully integrated into society. So I think like, you know, from a metaphorical sense and, and in terms of like, you know, the, the idea um, and the values behind it, that technology worked in helping you understand and get a sense of, of confinement. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason why we chose, it's, it's very intentional to use VR to do this. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of impact, uh, you know, I think, uh, and I, I think, you know, the, the women we worked with would be so much better to answer this question, but I think I enjoy, like, to me, it was the most fulfilling process collaborating with these women who all are from Women's Prison Association. They're all formerly incarcerated. We worked with over nine of them over the course of two years. And, you know, having them part of the process, I think for them, seeing the, you know, after everything that we'd gone through, because I remember the first workshop we did, I took the headset and cameras to them, and I put them all in a headset to show them this is what VR looks like. Before that, nobody had ever been in a headset. I taught them storytelling, how to storyboard, because I wanted them, I wanted to give them the tools to participate into my, in my process and not just be like, oh, you've got a storyboard with us, but they don't know what storyboarding is. So, you know, the training was quite a long process. And then to like filming, some of them are actually characters in the film, in the VR film, uh, to post-production, showing them cuts, getting their insight into that. So I think for them, it was also, and this is what I've heard, is that that was sort of a process for healing and like, you know, feeling like, okay, we're coming to terms with what happened to us and how we can actually use this one of the women in the piece used the project to apply for an open society fellows uh, a fellowship you know she wanted to use that work in order to take it to more low income communities so that she can show them how we can use this in order to open a dialogue about incarceration community policing things like that um, so I, I would say you know I, I definitely think that it had an impact on them beyond just the the presentation of the process of project it was the process as well and i think there were two other elements too you know one was the google aerial images uh yeah. you know it turns out the united states has more uh, prisons jails and detention centers and colleges and universities and so to see the you know enormous number of, of them as kind of a wallpaper as part of it and also the statistics that the us i think has about 3% of the women in the world and 40% of the incarcerated women in the world, or something like that. So I think that, you know, you used, um, you grounded it with statistics, you know, with, with nonfiction as you went into a fictional kind of space as well, uh, too. And then do you want to talk maybe a little bit then uh, about uh, the project you did in, in Yemen as well, which is immersive in a different way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll show just a bit a starting of the clip of Yemen Skies of Terror. Mm -hmm. And all of this work is available for, for everybody to see on our website, ajcontrast.com. Um, with Yemen, just to preface that, this was a documentary we did about the war in Yemen. And this was the documentary that was nominated for an Emmy a few years back. Uh, it was all filmed and uh, created by 
local Yemenis. So from the animation that you're going to see in the first scene, the Yemeni animator, to the sound score, the music, Yemeni musician. The filming was done by local journalists on the ground uh, who we trained, actually. We sent cameras through UNESCO because it was really difficult to get anything to Yemen. Um, and so, you know, we sent it to UNESCO. We sent them Arabic manuals, trained them essentially on WhatsApp, and on Facebook audio and you know worked with them as they were filming they sent footage we gave feedback and then that's how the process it took us you know it was close to a year to, to just do a seven to eight minute clip but I'm going to show you just the first minute of it closed my uh, screens by mistake. I'm Akram. I live in the old city of Sana'a. We were all asleep when all of a sudden we heard a big explosion. The next morning, we learned that the missiles hit the house of our neighbor. His name was Heft al Aini. Ten members of his family died. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag in that because I'm playing it through playback through Zoom. Mm -hmm. So that's the Yemen piece. Uh, I, I would highly recommend that people look on their cell phones because you can move the phone around and look in different directions. So you're not stuck in one point of view, one perspective. And it's really, you know, quite immersive and, and, and quite troubling, uh, you know, to, to, to look through it. Um, so, you know, that would be, um, I'm also gonna put in the chat, there's a the second website that uh, we did with AJ Contrast on the still here, um, and that has the statistics. And it's actually 4% of the women in the world live in the US and 30% of those incarcerated are there. So people could check that out as well in terms of doing it. So what was the response to the piece on Yemen? What, what were the uh, criticisms or positive reinforcement or what was people's sense of it? You know, I get, I, I it, before, before doing the Yemen piece and before doing a lot of the pieces, you know, I, I got, I heard a lot of comments about people talking, you know, well, you're training people in parts of the world where they don't even have clean water and you're teaching them how to use a 360 camera, sort of like, you know, why this, why, give them these tools when you can give them something that's more essential. And my answer to that is, well, you know, I think people, everybody in the world should be able to tell their own stories. And if there are different tools to tell those stories, despite their economic status or the conditions, they should at least know that those tools are available and should have the education. Because I think, you know, we create the narratives and because for so long the power has rested in the Western world and has rested predominantly with a lot of white creators, 
stories get told from their perspective. And so what was happening in the immersive space is that because those were the people who had the tools and the knowledge, they were the only ones telling the story mm -hmm. and the others could not participate. So I, I know maybe after we went there, they probably some of them probably never used a 360 camera after, but that's fine. If you, even if it, you know, there are a couple of them that continue to use it, or there are other people who are able to train and pass that knowledge and know that, you know, that's not inaccessible to them. That's that's just what we're kind of, we're we're trying to do. Um, at, the, at the end of it, the little boy, uh, the, the boy and the little girl asked the question. I yeah. hope this helps the world to to hear, to see, to pay attention to what's going on in Yemen. You know, you have a statistic in it of the number of bombings, bombings, more and more, you know, bombings, airstrikes, people lost, you know, 10 members of the family, you know, it's horrific. And do you have a sense that using this kind of technique strategy, you know, I've, I've, you know you, you're making the strong point that it's helpful for the people to self-represent, but is it getting to the world in a different way, for example, than a Western journalist using video or photography might do? Yeah, I mean, I would I, I would argue that it does not because not not because of the medium per se, not because it is VR, but because we actually collaborated with the people we did to tell the story. Mm -hmm because we used everybody on that piece who did it except for my team everybody is from is living in yemen or are yemeni or are living abroad mm -hmm. and so i would say it's because they were allowed to self-represent because they were allowed to have a say in their narrative and 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 decide what type of music and what type of animations best represented their plight and their country and their people i do think that you know i would like to hope that it's a better representation uh, and in terms of like using VR, well, I hope that, you know, people who use Oculus and HTC Vive and, and, and all the other headsets, and there are many of them, we're providing them content that is different than what you usually find in those headsets. And at least, you know, for some of those people, it's something they can learn. It will be trying, we're targeting a different audience in, in that sense. So there's a difference in terms of authenticity coming from the inside. You know, yeah. which then gets a different audience and a, a different credibility than than somebody coming from the outside who may not speak the language and doesn't really know what's going on. And you know, because when when we are when when we are started, the, the videos that were being made was like, what does it feel like to be inside a refugee camp? What does it feel like to be inside you know so and so place? And a lot of those places were either places in war zones or in developing countries. It was voyeuristic. It was like, oh, I can kind of feel like what it likes to be to be that person. But just because you put on a headset doesn't mean you can feel what it is like to be them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like this false sense of empathy that I think some sometimes uh, it sometimes is worse because now you're not pretend now you're pretending to know what somebody's going through because uh, you are yeah. because, exactly. You know. Okay, and just for time reasons, there's a third project you had wanted to share as well. Yeah, and this is this is a lot more, um, I would say, traditional because I, there are a lot of news organizations that are doing inter interactive web-based storytelling really well. Uh, but I just thought, since we're showing different work, I could show this as well, just to show that we work in many different mediums, and it's not just VR and AR. Uh, but it's also more web-based traditional interactive stuff. Hold on. So this is, um, we did this, a web interactive called Living in the Unknown, and it essentially tells the story or it follows four Uyghur girls who are living in Turkey, who had to escape, you know, what's happening in China, the atrocities in China, and, and have sought refuge in Turkey. Uh, again, in this, we've collaborated with as many locals as we could find, uh, the animations, the graphics, the music, all done by Uyghur artists and musicians. Um, we worked with the local Uyghur uh, fixer, journalist on the ground, and, you know, we had our two people from our own team who also went to Turkey to record all of this and, and work on it. 
I just want to show you like the different things that we've included in the interactive, it's graphics, you know, it's animations. This, this rotates. So then you can click on, you know, anybody's photo, let's say, wherever. And then we have these boxes where you can learn more about the issue, go in depth. Use a lot of GIFs, a lot of photographs. This is the anime. This is all done by a Uyghur artist, these animations. So, yeah, that's we have infographics, the display, some of that. Okay, I think that's yeah. This recently won the Amnesty Media Award and uh, won the Online Journalism Award for this as well. So, so what would you tell a, a young person today who wants to, you know, make a difference with media, who wants to kind of get by the filters, say something important, you know, change the world for the better? What do they have to know or how do they have to think or, or you know, what are the possibilities that are not the conventional ones at this point? I would, I mean, I would say not to limit yourself by medium and tools because those are constantly going to change and they're going to evolve. I think figure out what your values are, what are the causes that ignite your passion, that, you know, inspire you, and let those determine what are you going to use to tell those stories. The most important thing is to tell the stories and to highlight the voices. Uh, the tools are secondary, you know. The tools are, they're important. It's not that they're unimportant, but I think learning how to use tools is not difficult. Learning how to use a VR camera is not tough, uh, given that, you know, we have everything accessible on the computer and, and the internet now. So I would not be fixated that, you know, I only do video, so I'm not going to do anything else. Or I only do VR and I'm not going to use photographs because photographs are really traditional. You know, I've, I've never thought of my work like that. I always decide, okay, this is a story we need to tell. Now let's find a medium that works best to tell the story in. And in terms of one's consciousness or ethics or philosophy or politics, what's your suggestion keeping foremost in your mind as you, as you proceed? Um, I'm sure you have you know, ways of thinking it through and thinking it through with your colleagues. What, what do you think about you know, when you take on a new story, you decide to do something, does, how, how do you select stories, what to do? You know, what, what's your way of judging importance and, and then following through? I don't want to get into trouble by giving a wrong answer to this. Um, I mean, this is, you know, this is an ongoing conversation and I can't say every decision I've made is the right decision, but at the moment when I was making these decisions, they felt right. For example, when we were doing the Yemen skies of terror, one criticism we got is that you never included the Saudi side of the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was not my intention. My intention was not to make it seem like an objective two side story. Mm -hmm. Here I was working with people on the ground to show how their, what their life looks like mm -hmm. in their situation. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I needed to include a statement from Saudi or to present their facts and what they're saying about the war in Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, and so like on, on you know, and I, we got that a lot. In fact, I got that within Al Jazeera as well. It's like, you know, where is the other side of the story? Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, you know, there are, there are a lot of issues in today's world. We, we see that I, I think we, I went to journalism school where we were like, what was drilled down was that you've got to be objective and objective means presenting both sides of the story. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, we are starting to move away from that way of thinking and to, you know, to present things, I, I would say more authentically. But, but you're still being fair. You may not be objective. I'm not sure objectivity actually exists. Um, it just seems to be a convention. You know, 99.9% people believe climate change exists, but you have to ask the 0.1% be quote unquote objective. One of the questions in the chat is from Jackie, uh, is how long are you working on, on the, a story? Is it, you know, how long is an average story or whatever? Yeah. So, you know, I think we're at a, I mean, and I understand we're in an incredibly privileged position because I work on the innovation storytelling team, which is all long special projects. So we are able to take time to do on. So still here, we're working for a year and a half without like, you know, the Sundance premiere, I think in total, we're working on it for two years. Um, for Yemen Skies of Terror, because of, you know, the transmission of footage and, you know, how, how difficult it was to actually get stuff. We worked on, we, we started from the start to the publishing, it took one year. Living in the Unknown took, um, I would say, six months. Uh, that's how long it was in production. And the other reason why we're able to do that is, as I mentioned in the start, it comes back to the money when you're working for an organization, everything is about the money. Uh, I baked in a business model, which we do a lot of projects on the side with uh, nonprofits and other companies that actually pay to do content uh, as, colla- as partnerships. So because I have that money coming in and you know, I, I, I'm able to let these projects be to take their time. Mm-hmm. But, but it still seems that some of the models that you're developing can be useful for people even working in their own neighborhoods. In other words, they don't necessarily have to work thousands of miles away, like Yemen, you know, if somebody's living far from there, but they could work in their, you know, if you live in Chicago, you could work in Chicago and, you know, pass around virtual VR equipment or, you know, immersive equipment or whatever way you want to do it and hear the voices of people. So not necessarily would it have to take two years to do it. And, you know, when you're working much more locally at that point. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just, just for context, like still here took so long because even we're doing this project, you have to understand when I say like the, 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 the immersive field is very homogenous and, and, that is still that's still a problem right now so when we were looking for a script writer for the vr piece and the ar piece and for a director for the vr piece Mm -hmm. we couldn't find many black creators who had already worked in that medium and you know the woman we worked with naima ramos chapman for the vr script and the direction she's phenomenal she's an incredibly talented woman she's very well known she currently has you know has been working on random acts of flyness which is on hbo i mean you know she's very accomplished in the entertainment space and carvel who wrote the script for the ar piece is also an incredibly accomplished writer has wrote uh, biographies and books and you know writes in vanity fair Um, but we had to spend a huge portion of our time as we were training as we were collaborating with these participants to work with the talent we had hired to train them on how to actually storyboard for those mediums. Um, So, you know, all of that takes time. If we didn't have to do all of that, it would have taken much shorter, but the purpose was that we were also building skills and training people rather than just creating a project. And everybody from who worked on the Still Here project, everybody came, everybody outside of our team, of my team, came from the community, Naima's father was in prison for, I think, if I'm not mistaken, over 10 or 15 years as well. You know, Carvel's worked closely on this issue, like the actors, everybody had some relation to the issue of incarceration. So when you do all of those things, when you take the time to sort of like make sure, you know, experiences and people and, you know, things like that are represented, it takes longer, but I think at the end, it is worth it. So there's a few more questions. Ken Kamara says he's working on a documentary about systemic racism in the hope of educating people about the histories in certain parts of the world. 
what advice and strategy would you give to someone who's having to present the idea to media houses and platforms? Are there other media houses and platforms that are receptive to this kind of you know, immersive work, multidisciplinary work, or are you kind of unique at AJ Country? I would say black public media is excellent. And in fact, Lisa, who heads the emerging department at black public media is going to be on our panel on Wednesday. She would be a fantastic person to connect to and they give money, they give grants and they help with the production side and the marketing distribution. So, I mean, they immediately come to my mind. And there's another question from uh, Pianchi who's asking, uh, other than changing your accent, or not having the right accent, are there any other challenges you faced or fundamental changes you're requested to do in order to thrive in this industry here in the US as a woman and especially a woman with a different culture? Were you asked to modify yourself in order to fit in? I mean, yeah, I think so. <laughs> there are so many, I don't know where to start. <laughs> and then, you know, some in, in, many, in many ways I have changed and modified myself to make myself more appealing to the industry. And there are lots of changes that I have resisted, but you know, it, it goes from everything to like, I mean, I, I, more fundamentally, a lot of it is the ideas and your politics. Um, I think you know, that's what I face, for example, at the Huffington Post is mm -hmm. that when you have people working in your organization who sit on the board of Uber and who are associated to different practices practices or ideas and then you're trying to do stories that you know are critical of those things um it becomes hard and you know those are i think everybody who works in media or works in a corporation grapples with with those issues i think those were the ones that i resisted because they felt very core to me um mm -hmm. my beliefs and my politics i think mm -hmm. um but there were others like for example the way i dress i what I look like when I moved here to now is very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Serge Montillas is asking, how many members comprise a single story project team that you produce on average? I understand that some of your subjects themselves, and Zara does not like the word subjects, by the way, were the ones holding the 360 cameras. Maybe you'll explain that, but from a production side, how lean is a typical ARBR production team? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a really good question. And the answer is that it can be as lean as you want, depending on the scope of your project. So if it's just a 360 camera, you can have just one person who's filming um, and one person doing audio. So our, three, six, our, our, VR, our VR productions are typically much smaller. I would say like when I've been out in the field filming, I've had a team of maximum three people and a fixer. So I've had a camera person, I directed a lot of them, and then I'd have a sound person. And then we had a fixer if we needed that, depending on the location. Um, when I'm talking about a production like Still Here, it's much more than a VR piece. It's actually an interactive piece, which once you film, you've got to put it into a Unity game engine, which is how video games are actually built. So the production side of it, like filming it because it was a piece of fiction, we had a direct, I mean, we had like 50, like at least I would say, including actors and like wardrobe person and makeup and all of that. We had 50 people present at the shoot. And then for the product, we had a production company that had around like five people on their team who were working to create that on the back end, that experience. So, I mean, just to give you a sense, the still here piece was budget was around 400,000 without marketing and PR. So that, that was an expensive, uh, was an expensive production. We have about one minute left. Zara, it's up to you. Is there anything you want to say? Words of wisdom, concluding thoughts? I, I have no wisdom, Fred. That's all you. No, you no, are no. the one who imparts wisdom. No, no, no. You're the one with the wisdom. Anything, any uh, deep thoughts? Uh, you want to tell us why the word subject is a bad word? Uh, any final, final statement? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I like using collaborator or, part, or as you mentioned, participant or even protagonist, as you mentioned this morning, I, I like that. I think because uh, I, I would like to believe that the people we work with have much more agency in the story rather than us just documenting them or putting a camera in front of them. They have a say in how they're represented. So, 
you know, collaborative feels like a, a process rather than just an idea of what somebody should be. So you, so you may not be objective, but you certainly don't want to objectify. Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing. Okay, so I think we hit the three o'clock uh, yes. time in New York. Perfectly timed. Thank you. I would just like to read the beginning of the question that Fred read the end of, because it was more of a comment to you, Zara, that I thought you should have to, um, that said, from Misery University to now, what you've accomplished to me, and I'm sure to many in audience, is extraordinary. So let me start by saying congratulations. And I'd like to end on that note, and also knowing that you're going to, you know, I know we're going to be seeing you in the next um, couple of days, introducing us to so many of the people you've been talking about today. And this is really something to look forward to, but thank you so much for today's conversation, both you and Fred this morning. This was a beautiful way to start the, the, this final chapter. Thank you. Thank and you do so you want much. to announce Thomas for tomorrow morning? Yes, we're just gonna have a reminder of the schedule for tomorrow. Um, so this is all in British summertime. We've got Thomas, um, and then looking at the impact of social media, Gaza and COVID and the climate crisis, and finishing up um, and with some fantastic speakers who, Fred or Zara, anything else you wanna add? We've kind of been through that this morning, but perhaps people missed it. No, no I, I think that what we're trying to do today is you know, talk to us about the conceptual issues and practice. And then tomorrow we're gonna to see how people implement it in different ways, different possibilities, different models that are being built. And for me, it's very much about model buildings, you know, parameters. So pe people come up with different strategies and then people could build on them and, and keep pushing these ideas forward. That's the idea. So inspiring. Yes, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank you, Zara. And thank yes. you, Fred. And we'll see you tomorrow. And thanks everyone for joining. Yes, thank you all. Good night. Bye. Bye.